Pollard. Okay, we are going to be talking about the end of chapter 14, which is non-Mendelian genetics. So let me share my iPod and we'll get there, get it going. Oh, come on. Oh, there we go. If I only spoke in accents the whole time, it would be more fun, but I don't know me accents very well. All right. So um, we are starting here at the end of chapter 14, variations from Mendelian genetics. So when we're talking about Mendelian genetics, we are really talking about what we call complete dominance, where you're either dominant or recessive. Those are the two kinds of traits you can show. Right. But there are some weird um, other options for inheritance. So there's three other ways that alleles can kind of interact with one another other than just being dominant or recessive. All right. And the three are incomplete dominance, co-dominance, and having multiple alleles. Right. And we'll talk about each of these on um, their individual slides. All right. So the way I think of though, really briefly, incomplete is kind of a, giving a blended phenotype. That's my abbreviation for phenotype um, because the phi, that's a phi sign. So phi type phenotype. Um, then we have co-dominance where both um, phenotypes of the parents are expressed. And then we have multiple alleles where instead of having just two alleles in a population, um, humans can have, or other organisms can have more than two alleles in a population. Remember, if we are diploid, every individual only has two alleles, one from mom and one from dad, right? That's diploid. However, in the population, you can have more. And we're going to look into that with blood types. All right. So the incomplete dominance, this is where we have an expression of a phenotype that is intermediate or kind of blended um, to those of the parents. So you're not showing one or the other, you're kind of showing a blending. And when we talk about incomplete dominance, we do not use small and big letters for the genotype. We're using only big, right? So for red, we are going to make the genotype big R, big R. For the white phenotype, our genotype is gonna be big W, big W and they come together to make this intermediate phenotype, which is the pink. So let's do that Punnett square here. So if we have an, a red flower and a white flower, they're going to come together. So red can either make, give you an R allele or an R allele. The white can give you white, sorry, gametes, white or white. When they come together, what we're going to see is that you're going to get 100% RW genotype, and then that would produce a pink phenotype, all right? Um, and I want you to think about what would happen if you mated two pink flowers together, right? So if we do that, remember this individual can either give an R or a W, same with the other one. And then what you'll notice is that you get a different kind of ratio. You get one red, you get two pink and you get one white, right? So you get a different ratio depending on what's being mated. All right, so for co-dominance, we are going to look and we're gonna see both phenotypes expressed, all right? So the full phenotypic expression of both members um, of a heterozygous gene pair. So for example, if we had, and again, for co-dominance, we use only big letters, right? So here we have a white flower and we have a red flower, and we're gonna see that they are both dominant. You get expression of both. So if we do the Punnett square, you are gonna see again, you're gonna get 100% RW, which means red and white being shown, right? And again, I want you to think about, um, I, hold on, let me see if I can pause this really quick. Okay, I've never paused a video before us, so hopefully that worked. We'll see. Okay, let me see. Um, okay, 
All right. So um, here um, again, we have a hundred percent red and white flowers. And when we would mate those two to each other, I want you to kind of think about what the genotype and phenotypic ratios would be, right? Um, again, we'd have one, um, one red flower, two red and white flowers, and two white flowers, right? So for both incomplete dominance and co-dominance, we are using only big letters, um, and you have a different kind of inheritance. All right. For multiple alleles, this is one of my favorites because it's so applicable for humans, um, is when genes have um, genes may have more than two alleles within a population. Again, every individual is still a diploid, so they will ex- have two alleles, one they got from mom and one from they got from dad, right? Um, the example for multiple alleles, the best example is ABO blood type, all right? So for blood type in humans, there are three different alleles that can exist in a population right? You can have what is called a big, big I A, right? Um, So big I A, that will cause the, um, cause their blood cell, the red blood cell to express a glycoprotein, a carb, a sugar. Hmm. Glycoprotein, glycoprotein, glycolipid, Glycoprotein. Anyway, it'll have it, it. It'll cause it to express a red, or sorry, a um, a a carbohydrate that we're calling A. The second allele, big I B, will give a B carbohydrate. And if you have a little I, you will have no carbohydrate. All right, and you can have any combination of two of those. Right. So the different genotypes that you can have are. IAIA or IA little i. Those are both going to give you A sugars on the on the cell and you'll be type A. If you are type B, you would be IBIB or IB little i, right? If you have IAIB, then you are type AB. If you have no sugars on here, you are type O and your little I, little I. So I want you to think about this. Which one of these would be the universal acceptor and which one of these would be the universal donor, right? I want you to think about that for a moment. And the, oh, oh my goodness. Okay, um, let's see here, sorry. Um, and so the, oh, sorry. Getting my son is a little gray, gray right now. Just a minute. Um, let me just double check where we are with this. Sorry about that. Um, okay. All right. Okay. Um, let me go back to sharing. Sorry. I apologize. Oh my gosh. Come on. Okay, here we go. All right, sorry, back where we're at. Okay, so again, these are glycoproteins um, that are adding carbohydrates to the surface of these red blood cells. And the universal donor, meaning you can go into any, would be type O, right? Which would be the I, little I, little I genotype. And that's because they don't have any sugars that would respond negatively to anybody else. The universal acceptor, meaning they can accept blood from anybody else, is type AB, right? So the genotype is IAIB, and they have all of the possible sugars. So it doesn't matter what blood that they take because they're not going to elicit an immune response because they have all of the possible sugars. All right, so another one is called pleiotrophy. And this is a very complex word, pleiotrophy, for a very common situation. And this is where a single gene 
can give multiple phenotypic effects, right? And our big example is um, here is sickle cell anemia. And, but I will tell you almost all, almost all genet human genetics, all, almost all human um, genetic diseases are pleiotrophic, meaning they have one gene affected that causes many, many different effects. All right. So just as an example, if you have, if you're recessive for the sickle cell anemia um, and you have the disease, then it causes um, your red blood cells to be sickled, but that causes a huge number of effects all the way from, you know, kidney failure to um, impaired mental function to paralysis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Polygenic has a very, uh, very uh, name that makes a lot of sense. Poly meaning many, gen genic meaning genes. Here we have many genes affecting a single phenotype, right? Many genes, right? So when you have many genes, two or more genes that kind of affect a single characteristic or phenotype. And this always gives you what is a, this kind of gives you a characteristic Gaussian or bell-shaped variation. And some examples are human height and human skin color, right? So when you look at, at human height, right, we don't only have tall or short, we have a variation within the population. And if you lined up the number of individuals across height, you will always see, you know, most of the time, you will see kind of a bell-shaped curve where most people are kind of in this average zone, but we have some very short and some very tall. I mean, look at this monster woman. She's ginormous. Um, but in general, polygenic um, inheritance where you have more than one gene affecting a trait gives you this bell-shaped curve. Another example is skin color. We see this beautiful variation in kind of gradation in skin colors rather than like really dark or really light. We see this huge range, right? And um, this, we're not gonna really talk about how, how those get inherited right now, but, um, but what you'll see is that we have multiple genes being involved, okay. Epistasis, this is the last one and by far the most confusing one. And this is where the phenotypic expression of a gene at one place on a chromosome, one locus, can mask or alter that of a gene at a second location, all right? So epistasis, we're talking about two genes in different locations kind of interacting with one another. And our example here is in Labrador retrievers. Here we have two um, black labs, heterozygous for both genes, right? So if we have heterozygous for both genes, we're gonna have big B, little b, little, big E, little b, little e, right? And so what can, what are, what are, we don't know exactly what they, what the genes do yet, but what we'll see is that if you, for example, what, let's talk about the gametes. So the gametes can be both big, big B, little e, little B, big B, big E, or little, little, right? And so that's going to, again, make your chart. So what is the expected ratio of a dihybrid cross? right? And you can, should try to remember this with two heterozygotes, that'd be a nine to three to three to one ratio. That's what we're expecting. However, what you see when you made these two black labs that are heterozygous is that you get a different ratio. Instead of a nine to three to one, we get a nine to three to four ratio. All right. And what this is, this is a sign of epistasis where what it's showing is that it, you must have a dominant E in order to get any color at all. So for example, this little guy here, little b, little b, little e, little e, is not its own separate genotype. Rather, this goes in to the other ones, into the other group. So we have four labs 
that are yellow labs. We have nine that are the black and we have three that are brown. So epistasis gives you a funny ratio, nine to three to four, instead of your nine to three to three to one. And on a test question like that, you would really have to read the question carefully to fully understand what, what's going on in terms of one gene kind of masking the expression of another gene. All right. And the last one, the last thing we're talking about with um, kind of non-Mendelian genetics is nature versus nurture. And you've probably heard that in the news a lot. So when we're talking about nature, we're talking about the genes. When we're talking about nurture, we're really talking about the environment that an organism is living in, all right? And um, there's two good examples about this. One, my students almost always remember because it's so crazy and it has to do with the Himalayan rabbit, all right? So, Himalayan rabbits, um, if a Himalayan, Himalayan rabbits are homozygous for an allele that specifies a heat sensitive version of an enzyme. And that enzyme is important in melanin producing, which is the pigmentation, right? So what that means is that melanin or pigment is only produced in cooler areas of the body, right? So normally, you have a kind of a rabbit that looks like this, where you have ears, nose, feet, and usually some, some kinds of the tail that um, is dark, right? Cooler, meaning you're getting that pigment produced, right? The experiment that they did is they took one of these little rabbits, they shaved his little back, they put an ice pack on him, and then they could see the, the prominence of this pigmentation showing up. All right, and if you put these rabbits just in cold weather, you will actually start to see little bits of pigmentation coming because the, that cooler area is now starting to produce those um, the pigment. All right, another famous one from humans um, is scurvy. Arr, matey, a lot of pirates used to get the scurvy. All right, and does anybody know why you get scurvy? right? That is a yeah, lack I mean, of vitamin C, right? Yeah. So vitamin C is absolutely required in our bodies. And if we don't have enough, we get this disease called scurvy, where you start losing your teeth and you get pale skin and shrunken eyes and you look like a pirate. All right. Um, so one thing that's important to note, almost all human diseases have both a genetic and an environmental component. Very few, like scurvy, are completely environmental. Almost all have both genetic and environmental. All right, lots of practice problems to practice. So get, get on to those. And we are done with chapter 14. Peace. Bye. Arr, matey. Goodbye. Have a good day.